Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Final Fantasy XIV Story Mode. Who's ready for a big fight against Shiva? Spoiler, we're going to be fighting Shiva. Come on, you knew what was happening. And I've already got a crew together. It's not usually a case that I can <laughs> get the crew assembled before I even start recording the episode. This is a fun novelty. We've even got one of them here, ready to tank for us. The tiny tank. <laughs> is represented in the party, so fear not. <laughs> Looking good doing it, too. Anyway, we got our crew assembled already. Let's see. Uh, Nismith playing Summoner. Tampopo playing a Dragoon as well. Uh, Kikau playing Paladin. Uh, Ellis as a White Mage. Astra as a Bard. Elena as a Astrologian. Yes, sometimes these symbols confuse me. And Orwell as a Summoner as well. All right, let's get ourselves in there. This should be a fun one. All right. For as long as their nation has warred with Dravania, there have been Ishgardians who instead chose to ally themselves with the dragons. Shiva is said to have been among the first, hence why the heretics revere her as a saint. That Iceheart and her followers intend to summon Shiva with the crystals they've stolen is plain, but is this unprecedented act even possible? If so, then Ishgard, if not the entire realm, is in grave danger. But not for long. Let's handle business. You should never have come here, warrior of light. I labor only to forge a lasting peace. A peace you would deny us out of ignorance and blind faith. No matter. If it is our fate to be at odds, then it is mine to strike you down. We whom gods and men have forsaken shall be the instruments of our own deliverance. Partake of my flesh. Fill this vessel with your light. Walk amongst your brothers and sisters once more. Oh, Saint Shiva, still the hatred within our hearts and bless us to eternal grace. Well, <laughs> what a very good group we've got going. Stylish and ready for battle. And very dancey. <laughs> Enjoying the dances. So small and dancey. All right. Let's do this stuff, everyone. Dermot is ready. Begin battle. Now for this fight, the mechanics are actually pretty simple, especially these days. Not nearly as challenging as it would have been back in the day. Shiva will from time to time change which weapon she is wielding. She will either be wielding like an ice staff or an ice sword. And as soon as she switches, she'll use one of two moves. That was one of them. Uh, we also don't want to be standing in front of her. We also don't want to be standing in these very pretty danger puddles. If we can avoid it. Rise to join in the chorus, my brothers. Oh, oh dear. And now we need to take these out before she does her super move. Because if we've not taken them out, I think it'll hurt very bad. Burn him down. Gotta get this away from everyone else so it only hurts me. There we go. Okay. Stuff's gone. 
I'm probably standing a little too close to being in front of her. I don't want to get hit by something. So far, so good, though. Embrace the serenity. Renounce the hatreds that consume you. And now we are frozen. And scatter them like dust in the wind. And now it's phase two of the fight. With some very fun music. Oh, see those puddles flying around? The entire area is covered with danger puddles, but they're going to go off in the order they arrived, so we need to wait for the first one to go off and then run into that position. It's really a shame we're burning these fights down so fast. <laughs> Won't get to hear the tunes for very long. Yowza. Almost down. Hey, there we go. Boy, primals are getting weirder and weirder, huh? <laughs> In terms of how they're arriving. I guess we... I can't say they've been getting weirder. We had Good King Mogul Mog a few back. That's still maybe the weirdest one yet. <laughs> anyway, good job, everyone. You all did great. Thank you very much for joining me and looking so fashionable and being so helpful. I really appreciate all of you good Dantalus folks helping me with all this stuff. But now it is time to move on with the story, so I'm going to go do that. Thanks, everyone. You, of all people, should understand the suffering war begets. That no sacrifice is too great if it brings an end to the violence. Mine is the righteous cause. You fight in a war you do not understand. A pawn of liars and schemers. And they are no less ignorant than you, following the creed of their fathers without question, never thinking to ask why. Trapped in a delusion of their own creation and blind to the truth. Warrior of Light, redemption is not beyond us. We who walk before may lead those who walk after. Seek the Keeper of the Lake. See with eyes unclouded. Do... Do not squander Mother's gift. And so the vessel withdraws, a predictable outcome. Nevertheless, La Habrea will be pleased. How unfortunate.
Hmm, a new contender enters the scene. All right, we've handled business. Moonbrita, good news. I'm alive. You could you could probably tell that part of the news. But we won, which you could also probably tell because of the first thing. By the 12, you're alive. I mean, of course you're alive. Why wouldn't you be? Iceheart did what? And you're certain about that, are you? Trevanians are skilled with glamours, after all. Look, if you say that's what you saw, I believe you. It's just that I've never heard of a primal being summoned like that before. Are you sure you're not injured? Head trauma has been known to cause hallucinations, you see it. No? Fair enough. I was only asking. <laughs> it's a fair question. I get hit a lot. Though less so now that I've become a dragoon. It's not my job to get hit anymore. Moonbreeda remains unconvinced that you have not sustained a head injury. Still fair. If you ask me, there's naught to be gained from mulling over the implications of your story in the freezing cold. Let's save it for the Rising Stones, huh? I'll get everyone to meet us there. Uh, but before that, you'd best pay a visit to White Brim Front and speak with Alphano. He's probably worried sick about you. That, or he's busy playing at politics with the Ishgardians. Either way, I'm sure he'll be delighted to see you hale and healthy. Speaking of which, you don't have a headache or anything, do you? No? Blurred vision? No reason. See you again soon. <laughs> I'm fine. I think. Now I have doubts. Well, hello, one and all. Emmerich, been a while. That you stand here now is proof of your mission's success. Praise be to Haloni. There he is, and none the worse for wear. Was there ever any doubt that the Warrior of Light would succeed? I think I speak for all of us when I say that I, I should like nothing more than to hear the stirring tale of your victory, if you'd be so kind. Then we were too late to prevent the summoning. But not too late to present, uh, prevent further loss of life. An outcome worthy of celebration. And one for which we have Dermon to thank. Yes, you're right, of course, Sir Amaric. We should be content with what we've accomplished. I, for one, could not have wished for a better outcome. Shiva is no longer a threat, and the heretics have been routed. Aye, there is the matter of Iceheart's escape, but she cannot run forever. Whether it takes her days, weeks, moons, or even years, my knights will find her. In the meantime, Lord Driamont, is the caravan ready? The supplies that your men recovered have been prepared for transport, in accordance with your wishes. Rest assured that my knights will see them safely to Revenant's Toll. Of that I have no doubt. I take it these are the self-same supplies the heretics stole from the House Fortomp caravan? Less the crystals which comprise the bulk of the shipment, yes. Scarce a fraction of, what which, of that which was promised, but a meaningful contribution to your cause, all the same. Ah, on an unrelated note. Dermon. Might I trouble you to accompany me to Camp Dragonhead at your earliest convenience? Tis not for my benefit. A certain lord was most distressed when he learned of your intent to risk life and limb to stop Iceheart. It took half a dozen knights to restrain him, I'm told. Men give vent to their anxieties in myriad ways. Pray do not think less of him. Oh, how could we? What a tall sweetheart. All right, let's, you know, let's just take the fast way back. There we go. Poor Chiffon, was someone worried about me? If our business here is concluded, we should attend to Sir Emmerich in the intercessory. Not quite yet, I gotta say hi to Orchiphon. What were you thinking, Dermon? Wagering your very being on a dubious theory which might allow you to enter Iceheart's lair, knowing full well that she could have uh, she could have sufficient forewarning to complete her ritual to summon Shiva anyway? And then, and then, engaging the abomination in mortal combat! By the fury, Dermon, tis the stuff of ballads! A battle for the ages! Would that I'd been there to fight by your side. Yet here I was forced to wait, condemned to wander at the fate of a dear friend for a veritable eternity. I've not wished such torture on my most hated enemy. <sighs> but you're here now, and that's what truly matters. Let us move on. Sir Emmerich wished to have words with you and Master Alphano in private. He waits us in the intercessory. Okay. It's good to see you too, bud. Alright. Let's go see Emmerich. 
I'm so popular these days. On behalf of the Holy See of Ishgard, allow me to express my deepest thanks. Never before have we been required to contend with a prime. Indeed, there were fears in some quarters that our knights might not be equal to the task. From what we have now learned of these beings, I can say with certainty that we would have lost a great many men had the Scions not intervened. Then the argument for preemptive action should be self-evident. Perchance now you will reconsider my proposal that Ishgard move against Natalan. Ere we first met, a similar proposal was tabled, but the Holy See decreed that we were to observe and that military action should be taken only in self-defense. All things considered, it was not an unreasonable decision. Since the Calamity, two vigils have fallen to the Horde, while Garuda has never shown any inclination to storm the Gates of Judgment. Which is why this unprecedented crisis and its resolution may prompt a change in policy. Emmerich's voice is so good. But if it sounds familiar, by the way, any Dark Souls 3 players, I believe it's the same voice actor who voiced Hawkwood uh, in Dark Souls 3. Very good voice, and also one that he'll be keeping. Unlike most of the actors you're hearing so far, uh, Emmerich's voice is the guy who's cast to voice him in Heavensward. So we'll still be hearing him. He's one of the early Heavensward voices we're starting to hear. And if you're feeling like the quality of his voice is very good, well, you've much to look forward to then, don't you? <laughs> anyway. You who have faced these primals know well the threat they pose. Ishgard did not. Not until now. And there is naught like a brush with death to change a man's outlook. At the very least, this should silence any lingering objections to our arrangement with Revenant's toll. The Holy See may even feel moved to grant us its formal endorsement. So far as it is possible, the Scions shall be compensated for their service. We should be grateful for any aid you can provide. As a gesture of good faith, I shall withdraw my previous request. Your people are doubtless needed elsewhere. That will not be necessary. We too have a vested interest in watching Dravania's movements. I see. Once more, I must thank you. Sir Emmerich, if I may, do you truly believe that Midgard Zoma could return? The heavens are a window unto truth, but those who interpret their movements are not infallible. I requested your involvement as a precautionary measure. But of course! You sought an excuse to compensate us from the first, mindful of what would happen if Revenant's toll were taken by your enemies. Ishgard is not wont to aid its neighbors, but that does not preclude it from manipulating them to serve its own interests. Choose your next words carefully. Do you know what sort of man becomes Lord Commander of the Temple Knights? One who comes from good stock. I did not. Yet here I am. Now, why do you suppose that is? Because I swiftly learned to tell the difference between words, deeds, and beliefs. You are correct, Master Leveilleur. Ishgard desires to see Revenant's toll flourish, as it would present a troublesome obstacle to our enemies from the south. We are so glad to be of use to you. As we are to you. Ours is a mutually beneficial arrangement, lest we forget. One born of necessity. The dragons grow more restless by the day, and the heretics harry us nigh without cease. We have contended with such troubles for centuries, but there are limits to even our endurance. Yet as a pauper is loath to part with his meager possessions, the leaders of Ishgard are not wont to render up their trust to outsiders. But with perseverance on our part, they may yet be made to see the light. Nevertheless, one must take care when walking the road less traveled. Wise words, Sir Emmerich. I shall make a point to remember them. I must apologize for my earlier outburst. 
I hope it will not sour our good relations. Not at all. You but spoke from the heart. I trust you understand that at times my duties may prevent me from meeting with you. On such occasions, my second-in-command will speak for me. Lucia, at your service. Pray excuse our reticence. We are but wary of speaking too freely, lest our sentiments be made known to our enemies. Know that the Lord Commander and I are of one mind, for the sake of Ishgard, and of Eorzea at large. I pray our peoples can put aside their differences. Those who dwell in the past risk losing sight of their future. Should aught befall one of our shipments, pray inform Lucia immediately. You may also relay to her any words you might have for me alone. Not being of Ishgardian birth, she owes no allegiance to any noble house, making her as near to incorruptible as one confined in my homeland. Suffice it to say, I trust her completely, and so may you. Which reminds me, Lord Orchafon, if you would be so kind? Certainly. In times such as these, trust is ever in short supply. Mayhap this will go some way to rectify the problem. The results of our investigation into the heretic's recent attacks, as well as our interrogation of the merchant you detained. Sir Emmerich, I cannot thank you enough. Think nothing of it. Ishgard may be many things, but it is no friend to Garlemald. Did I not tell you to have faith, my friend? Ah, I like them. And yeah, that's the caliber of voice acting we can start expecting once Heaven's Word and Onward comes around. So uh, <laughs> as good a job as all of these uh, Realm Reborn actors have been doing, especially since they've been clearly given more time and better direction in these patches, uh, the uh, Heaven's Word switch over to a lot of to a new voice cast or a mostly new voice cast is a pretty big thing. Alphano, how's it going? For one with reason to celebrate, Alphano looks rather grim. It would seem we have much to discuss with our friends at the Rising Stones. If what you say is true, Iceheart's method of summoning Shiva defies all precedent. It necessitates a complete reappraisal of the primal threat and of our approach to combating it. Moreover, there are grave ramifications if word of this incident reaches Imperial ears. The Garlean Empire believes that primals are an insufferable menace, that their mere existence is a threat to this very star. As such, they deem any action taken against the beast tribes to be justified by default. Imagine, then, if it became known that it was not only the beast tribes of Eorzea that could summon a primal, but her civilized peoples as well. Any lingering objections to the Eorzean campaign would vanish overnight. Where before we had to contend with a single Imperial Legion, we could well find ourselves facing the combined might of all Garlemald. But I speak unadvisedly. Come, Darman, it's better that we continue this conversation in Mordona. Sounds good. I shall meet you there. Buy a sweater. I know you can afford one, nerd. Hmm, everyone's moved. I bet they're saying new things. So, how's juggling going? There's little fortune and far less fame in being a receptionist, but one must be realistic. Also, it would seem that I grossly mis was grossly misinformed regarding the average earnings of a street performer. <laughs> oh, look, considering career changes, that's okay. Uh, I do not fault Sir Emmerich for being less than forthcoming with his beliefs. Not even the Highborn are beyond the reach of the Inquisition. True, young leaders can be more amenable to new ideas. Then again, their lack of experience and influence can hinder their ability to enact reforms. Quite a discussion happening at that table. Flamin, how are you doing? Ah, forgive me, Dermin. I thought I had prepared enough meals for everyone, but the others were most hungry. <laughs> That's okay. I make my own meals these days. Uh, hello. What you two do is your own business. Don't say I didn't warn you. What's... Oh, they're having a contest, I guess. Um, and Thancred's losing. Hey, hey, I just, I just gotta say, you're, you're pretty... You're all right. 
Ah, uh, he's losing bad. Trying to tumble the table now, are we? Don't give up yet, boy. Ida, line him up. <laughs> Moonbreed, I like you. You're good for this place. Calm yourself, Coltone. It's just a little ship after practice. Clears out the cobwebs to no end. A sip before practice, a sip after practice, and all too often a sip during practice. I do believe Moonbreed is having quite the bad influence on you. <laughs> okay, well, she's like 95% good for this place. Let's go check in. And how are we doing? Words cannot well express how glad I am to see you return to us hale and whole. And words cannot ex well express how glad I am that you guys are voice acting so much these days. Needless to say, I am most eager to hear your account of that which occurred in Curthis, assuming you're ready to speak of it. Excellent. I shall summon the others at once. Iceheart used her own body as a vessel for a primal soul? Master Louis Soir's writings make no mention of such a possibility. Can we be certain this entity was a primal? As certain as we can be that good King Mogomog the Twelfth was a primal, I should think. Both were ostensibly summoned. Let's not quibble over definitions. Of more concern is the implication that Iceheart retained her will, even after she was possessed. We are talking about a mortal, wielding the power of a primal. It can't possibly be that easy, can it? There must be some sort of sacrifice required. Or maybe she's just special? What qualities this woman possesseth, I know not. But full sure am I that she was groomed for this role. Few are privy to the secrets of summoning, and but a single party standeth to profit from their dissemination. Well, I wouldn't presume to comment on how the lass came to know about summoning, but I will say that what she summoned was a primal. The readings were the same, or near as damn it. Strange as it all sounds, it's really no different from what you've faced before. Then mayhap it is time that we re-examined our previous encounters. Oh, pack your things, Ida. We're going back to Gridania. Yes, sir! About Iceheart's final words to you. Hear. Feel. Think. Hydaelyn speaks to her as well. If Iceheart is blessed with the power of the Echo, she will doubtless have used it to further her goals. Or could it be that it was a revelation granted her by the Echo which first set her on this path? She did say that the Ishgardians were blind to the truth. Do you think she has knowledge of the origins of the Ishgardian Dravanian War? It would do much to explain her unwavering conviction. Did not the Lady Iceheart implore thee to seek the Keeper of the Lake? And did she not imply that in so doing thou wouldst come to see with eyes unclouded? Midgard Zoma was a king amongst kings who reigned for centuries on end. But he is dead and his wisdom lost to the ages. Unless the Ishgardians' fears are well founded. It would seem we have yet another reason to stand watch over the Keeper of the Lake. For a mercy, we are well positioned to do so. Iceheart, Shiva, Asians, and Midgard Zoma. I shudder to think how they're all connected. Boy, when you say it that way, we do have just a long list of problems we've not entirely resolved, don't we? Oh well. Back to work then. Minfilia would discuss how best to proceed in light of recent developments. I mean to scour the annals for knowledge of Midgard Sorma. Given his great age, I dare say he appears in more than a few. Hm? 
Do you hear that? The commotion outside. Would you see if aught's amiss? I'm on it. Hey, what's going on out here? Oh, Alphano, what's the problem? Dermon, tis well that you're on hand. We have a problem. Raya has escaped. It happened shortly after the immortal flames took her into custody. She'd been placed in a dungeon cell ahead of her coming trial, but apparently the accommodation was not to her liking. The turnkey was found slain along with two guards. Tis plain she received inside help. Citizens report seeing Raya quitting the city via the gate of Nald with a bloodied spear in her hand. She makes for Castra Meridianum, I'm certain of it. With her fate in Eorzea as good as sealed, what recourse has she but to flee to her Imperial masters? Even as we speak, Captain Ilbert and the First are hot upon Raya's heels. Pray make haste to Camp Blue Frog, uh, Blue Frog. I keep on wanting to say Blue Frog. It's not. To Camp Blue Frog and join the hunt. Should be Blue Frog, though. Anyway, let's go there. Come on, Blue Frog. Consider it. Ilbert, you like it, don't you? Sorry, you probably have more pressing matters on mind. My thanks for coming, Scion. I've spoken with the soldiers here. They say that Raya walked through the camp not a bell ago. Aye, she walked right through. You did not miss here. We have Raban's decision to keep the matter secret to thank for that. Bad for morale, he said. As a result, not a single flame in the garrison made any attempts to detain her, and so here we are. Raya must not be allowed to reach Castra Meridianum. All right, I shall help. I guess more specifically, Quayfriend shall help. My running speed leave something to be desired. Short legs. I am here. Oh, a duty. Goodness. This wretch was with Raya. He threw himself at us that his mistress might escape. She didn't even blink when we cut him down. Not even when he started screaming. No loyalty even to her own, the goddamned harpy. <laughs> with me, Scion, we almost have her. All right. Let us give chase. Okay, she does look pretty cool, though, you have to admit. Right? Sorry. Battle. I want Ryo alive. Kill the rest. For Eorzea! Alright. I shall assist. Yeah, after I hit the wrong buttons a million times. <laughs> Embarrassing. Ooh, let's set ourselves up for a big jump. I love all my jumpy abilities. They're so fun. An explosive. Yeah. Just knocking them down like bowling pins. Enemy reinforcements. Look sharp, men. Show them no quarter. Just a little more tidying to do here. More reinforcements? Are you serious? There's so many. Is that everyone? No? Nope. Still one more lurking over here, and you're done. Yay! Goodness, that was so many. <sighs> Bind her. And do it tight. Yes, sir. Good work, men. She and her Imperial cronies pushed us close, but we were better. Behold, a respected officer of the Immortal Flames... People looked up to you as one of the Order's founding members, one of its pillars. It saddens me to see you fallen so low. <laughs> what would you know of Lo? You, a spoiled little lordling who's never known any want. 
I... I... People such as you take wealth and birth for granted. You think it your God's given right to rule over others. You know not of our plight. The injustice we low-bornish guardians must endure. To the noble lords and ladies, we're not people, but resources to be consumed. I did what I had to do to survive. Stealing, killing, even whoring myself. It's no fault of mine if fools imagined me a paragon when I joined the flames. To hear you tell it, one would think you the only person ever to have suffered. In case you've forgotten, Rabban himself was born into poverty. As was I. We lived hand to mouth with little more than the shirts on our backs. Hunger was our constant companion. Yet never did we bemoan our lot in life, nor did we begrudge others their fortunes. We accepted the hand we'd been dealt and played it to the best of our ability. Life was a battle, aye, but no matter what fate threw at us, we took it on the chin and came back for more. Everything we have, we fought for. How are we any different, then? Tis true that we're both mercenaries of lowly birth. And tis true that we both had our fair share of struggles. But whereas I sold my sword, you, Marshal, you sold out your comrades. If life's taught me one thing, it's that you never betray your own. I'd sooner cut off my own arm than raise a hand against a friend. But enough talk. You will return to Uldar to face justice, and the people whose trust you've dragged through the gutter. Poof. Feels good to have accomplished some things. I joined the Crystal Braves that I might strike a blow against the Empire. Those who cast their lot with Garlemald should expect no better treatment. Alphano, you doing good? Not so much as a hint of remorse. Tis well that this sordid business is finally at an end. A friend's betrayal cuts deeper than steel. We must hope that we've chosen our own allies more wisely than Raban chose his. Indeed. Oop, missed. I've heard truly bothersome business. No, I do not foresee a problem on that front. The main concern is Roban. There is no telling what the brute might do. Have the blades watch him in the flames day and night. You may leave the Sultana to me. I shall personally attend her grace. one of the East Aldenard trade routes. That ought to keep Lolorito occupied for a while. Nanamo Ulnamo. For my sake, pray be a good little sultana to the last. Ominous. I'm sure it's fine. Alphano would ask another favor of you. Captain Ilbert and I have a few questions for the Flame Marshal regarding the circumstances of her miraculous escape. When we've completed our interrogation, we shall take our findings directly to General Raban, and that shall be the end of it. Your work here is done, my friend. My thanks. Ah, but I have one last task for you. Return to the Rising Stones and apprise Minfilia of all that's happened. I'm aware that the antecedents told Ra uh, held Ryu in high regard. For better or worse, she will want to know how this tale ends. Okay. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Alright, back to the Rising Stones. Minfilia, I come bearing mixed tidings. Welcome back, my friend. I have already received word from Alfino. To think that Flame Marshal Huayu was the Galian agent. I know not what to say. Together with Robon, Eline lent us much needed aid at the time of our order's founding. She was particularly passionate about the need to tackle the primal threat. When we discussed the subject, her eyes fairly shone with determination. Whatever else she may have been, I choose to believe that it was her true self with whom I spoke then. But now is not the time to dwell on such matters. I have an important announcement to make regarding our effort to defeat the Asians. 
We shall begin as soon as everyone is assembled. Ooh. Good job saying her name, by the way. You're better at it than me. My thanks for coming, friends. Moonbreeder, the floor is yours. By now, I'm sure you're all familiar with White Aurasite, the miraculous material that'll allow us to capture Asian souls. Back at Snowcloak, we verified its ability to absorb vast amounts of ether. Alas, it leaves something to be desired in the area of stability. The stone can only store ether for a short while before expelling its contents. In addition to Aurasite's inherent limitations, we must needs be wary of our enemy's strength. Our foe draweth upon an infinite wellspring of power. Even should we succeed in entrapping him, the stone will not long contain his wrath. Meaning that, if we want to kill the swine, we'll have to be quick about it. Tis our belief that an Asian soul may be permanently undone, if smitten by a sufficiently concentrated burst of pure ether. The only trouble is, we can't say for sure how concentrated the burst needs to be. Without knowing how much ether an Asian soul is composed of, we're basically guessing. Our sole clue lieth in thy struggle with La Habrea. During that encounter, Heidelin bid you forge what she called a Blade of Light, a weapon which took the form of a luminous stream of energy. Based on your description, we believe the blade with which you vanquished your foe was composed of ether. Admittedly, your victory proved ephemeral, as La Habrea was able to use a crystal of darkness to flee into the space that lies between our world and the void. The fact remains, however, that Heidelin placed the means to destroy the Asians in your hands. Be that as it may, it would be unwise to assume that she will do the same when we next encounter such a foe. Quite so, my lady. We must needs find the means to forge our own blade of ether, one to equal that which Hydaelyn did benevolently bestow upon her champion. That is all well and good, but it seems to me that producing such a blade will require a prodigious quantity of ether. Whence will it come, pray tell? Um, oh, what if we had two pieces of white orosite? One to trap the Asian, and the other to store the ether for the blade. Oh, nice try. But it's as I said, the stone won't hold ether for any length of time. We'd still need to collect the stuff there and then, sorry to say. And therein lies the rub. Finding a way to create the blade whenever and wherever we choose. It would seem more research is in order. I'm going to linger a while, perform a few more tests on the Aura site. And I could do with some help. Orianger, why don't you lend me a hand? M mine apologies, but I am required at the Waking Sands. Lady Minfilia hath given me sole charge of the premises. It would be unseemly to leave them unattended. Sole charge, you say? So you're basically alone there, then? Well, that settles it. I'll just have to come to you. While you were afield, word arrived from the Charlian Motherland. You will recall that a survey party was dispatched to investigate the incident of the Isle of Val, what they discovered was troubling, to say the least. According to the report, the Isle has been erased from existence. It was as if a hole had been torn in the very fabric of reality. Aye, yet the mystery endeth not with the Isle's disappearance. It hath come to light that a number of scholars in various other locales were reported missing at a similar juncture. I like her. What's more, they all had something in common with the head of the students of Baldessian. Every last one of them was researching a phenomenon called dimensional compression, or the rejoining as the ancient texts call it. I'll be damned if that's a coincidence. All indications suggest Asian involvement. But I sense that a force greater still is at work. The entity the Dark Beings call the One True God. 
We must pray that my dear friend Kryle regains consciousness soon. If she bore witness to the Isle of Val's final moments, she may be able to shed some light on this mystery. And there we go. And I believe... Um, uh, oh, more scenes. Never mind. Following the Calamity, the forces of the 14th Imperial Legion entrenched themselves in strategic locations across Eorzea. So swiftly did they accomplish this, it was suspected that they had received help. To think that it came from Huayu, my right hand. There is more. We have reason to believe that Huayu didn't deal exclusively with the 14th. She also answered to a higher authority in Golomol. But this higher authority could not have been the Emperor. By consenting to the media project, Solus Zos Galvis showed himself to be more concerned about preventing the spread of primal influence than claiming Eorzea for the Empire. He would happily have seen the lot reduced to ash. We believe a number of high-ranking figures within the royal household were against the decision, but that they knew better than to oppose the Emperor openly. Of course, this didn't prevent them from making clandestine provisions, in which Huayu played a part. Alas, these provisions did not prevent Dalamud from falling, and the ensuing chaos changed the face of the realm forever. Yet Eorzea survived. To all intents and purposes, the Meteor Project had failed, and the Empire was left to rue its lack of a decisive means to eliminate the Primals. Until, that is, it stumbled upon the Ultima Weapon. Even before the accursed thing was dug up, it seemed to me the 14th had the might to overwhelm our weakened armies. Yet they chose to hide behind their walls. Why? The Black Wolf was wary of making the denizens of Eorzea desperate, lest more primals emerge to bleed the land. The discovery of the Ultima Weapon, however, emboldened him to resume his war of conquest in earnest. But there was one in Garlemald who believed that Van Belsar's actions were premature. One who stood higher in the Imperial Army's chain of command. He ordered the Legatus to halt his advance, only to find that the Black Wolf had slipped its leash, and that the 14th now acted alone. In a bid to bring Van Belsar to heel, he used the agent he had planted in Ulda prior to the Calamity to undermine the Legion's efforts. A man who outranks Van Belsar, yet opposed the late Emperor's decision to annihilate Eorzea. This could only be the former High Legatus of the Galian army, now known as Emperor Voris Zos Galvis. So he was Huayu's true master. But one of several in actual fact, We've learned that even as Huayu served the Empire's interests, she sold Imperial secrets to a certain faction in Eorzea. In so doing, she helped to maintain the status quo, thus prolonging the conflict. Considering who stands to profit from war, it isn't hard to imagine who her other masters were. Seven Hells! You mean to say that she was a double agent? Huh, triple! if you consider her services to Ben Belsar and the new Emperor as separate. As neatly as these pieces seem to fit, one aspect of the puzzle remains unclear to me. By whose will was the Marshal feeding intelligence to the heretics? And try as I might, I fail to see how aiding their cause would profit either her Imperial or Monitorist Masters. Could it be that another hand is at work here? If so, why you must be made to reveal whose it is. <sighs> Not only have I lost a trusted friend, now I must interrogate her as a stranger. Not a pleasant task, I grant you, but a necessary one. Unless we weed out the ivy, root, stalk and stem, it will simply grow back. 
I know that full well. Those closest to Huayu have already been detained, and I will question them alongside her. General, pray keep in mind that there may be unwitting abettors among them. All will be treated fairly. On that you have my word. Those who are innocent have no cause to fear. You have ever been a friend of truth, General. I hope the unpleasant task of weeding out falsehood will not detain you too long. Though it be for the sake of Eorzea, doubting one's comrades is poison to the soul. And with that, I take my leave. Thanks for the exposition, fellas. All these years, I've been made to dance to their tune. How could you, Huayu? How could you side with... them? Those cankers! Who take from this land and give naught in return! Who use their power to disempower and grow fat while the people starve! I know you can hear me, monitor is scum! Your crimes will not go unpunished! One day I will purge this land of your sickness! Before the eyes of the Twelve, I swear it! I shall have no further need of you this day. Your Grace. I fear that not even mine own chambers shall remain private for long. Has the situation grown so grim? Ever since he proposed the Cardinal Reclamation Bill, Telegi Adelegi has risen to greater prominence upon the backs of impoverished refugees. The monetarists were ever united in their pursuit of profit, but the man's actions have torn a rift in their ranks. They snap at each other as rabid dogs. Yet now is not the time to be bickering among ourselves. If this bickering is a threat to law and order, might you not have grounds to dissolve the Syndicate? Would that the solution were so simple, Admiral. Alas, my moving to dissolve the Syndicate is certain to spark outrage among the influential merchant class, whom the Cabal represents. This would serve to exacerbate the current unrest, and peace would slip still further away. Be they rich or poor, natives or refugees, all who reside in Uldar have a right to pursue happiness. It is the duty of a ruler to protect this right. If I am to perform my duty, I must needs tread warily. It would not do to make enemies heedlessly. Were Lord Lolorito here, he would doubtless say that I have my head in the clouds. A ruler is required to take a wide view. Try as we might to cater to all needs, some will inevitably be overlooked. As such, there shall ever be citizens who feel aggrieved. It cannot be helped. But as you have informed us, the monetarists take no view but their own. They hunger for power while the masses starve. In the absence of a common cause, it seems beyond any one individual to make Uldar whole. And the presence of a Galian agent within the Immortal Flames only makes matters worse. Even accounting for Uldar's historic reliance upon mercenaries, such a grievous breach of security is unprecedented. I fear this business will provide the monetarists with a rod to beat Rauban. Eorzea can ill afford for the Immortal Flames to be dampened now. Ere long, the Garlians will turn their ravenous gaze toward our lands once more. If we are to resist their might, our nations must stand together. Yet for this to happen, our nations must be whole. Cannot be done to improve the situation in Ulda. The 
true wealth of Uldar lies in the health, happiness, and hopes of her citizens. Alas, the citizens shall never know these things, so long as their lives are ruled by the ambitions of the few. The monetarists claim to represent the best interests of the people, but in sooth they desire only to manipulate them for their own selfish ends. For the government to serve the people, it must be formed of the people. For Ulda to move forward, it is not only the Syndicate that must be dissolved. Nay, you jest. My friends, it was for no other reason than to make known to you my intent that I requested your presence here. When I make my declaration to the people, Chaos shall inevitably ensue. As the last monarch in the line of Ul, I make unto you this request. Help Roban to preserve order, and protect the people. Forsake them, and you forsake yourselves, for a strong Eorzea will ever have need of a strong Ulda. Your Grace, are you certain of this? There is no other way. When the time is ripe, the nation shall become a true republic. Both royalists and monetarists shall cease to be. Uldar will no longer belong to kings or queens or merchant princes, but to her people. Roban, forgive me for casting aside all that you have toiled for in my name. Beyond this gesture, I am powerless to help my subjects. Boy, things are getting interesting, aren't they? But that's the end of 2.4. We've not got much left. Just 2.5 and 2.55, so... <laughs> I don't know why they called it 2.55 and not 2.6. Whatever. There's not much left, and we're going to keep on gunning through it. No more detours. There's lots to see, and we're getting so close to Heaven's Word, and it's very exciting. Anyway, y'all, I will see you Friday when we get 2.5 started. Until then, do take care, and goodbye. Goodbye.